Hello and welcome to Giant Mass's Sloppy Sports and Entertainment Talk Show about the New York Giants, the Mets, movies, television, comedy, and a whole lot more. It's hosted by a giant mess. That's me, the real cinch, Neil Lynch. I'm a plump and furry Irish-Italian-American who graduated from a Catholic high school but isn't Catholic and a college known for producing doctors and lacrosse players, and then I became neither. Instead, I'm a failure. All around. Top down. 100%, y'all. You can leave me a voicemail, 862-BIT-1986, or you can text that number with graphic imagery of bloodied corpses, which is, seems to be in vogue now. You can subscribe to Giant Mess on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash Neil Lynch or slash Real Cinch. Follow me on the official blog, neillynch.com, facebook.com slash Giant Mess, Real Cinch on Twitter and Instagram. You can also subscribe to Giant Mess Podcast on Apple, Spotify, the Google, the other Mac. Um, I'm everywhere. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm everywhere. A little bit like God. A little bit like God. So on today's episode, what do we got? We're going to be reacting to the Emmys. We'll recap the past week in Mets baseball. We'll look at two more mistakes, two more strikes against Brody Van Wags in his bid to try and keep his job. We'll also take a look ahead at Steve Cohen's potential plans, the front office, who he's going to bring in. Who uh, is he going to keep? BV dubs? Doubt it. We'll recap the Giants' Week 2 game against the Bears. Pretty devastating first half, but showed a lot of fight in the second half. We'll take a look at Saquon and Shep's injuries. What does that mean for the squad moving forward? We'll talk a little bit about the Masterpiece Theater. That is James Bradbury. What a find. What a catch. And we'll preview the Week 3 game against the Niners. Spoiler alert, I think we have a shot. So with that... Let's dive right on in. Let's talk about life. Last time we talked to you was Thursday the 17th. That next day, Friday the 18th. Uh, got to enjoy episode five with the boys. Ordered $50 worth of Chinese food because my company, you know, they're good to me. They treat me right. And they said, hey, thanks for all your work over Q2. Here's $50 for food. They originally said for lunch, and I was like, "Can I use it for dinner?" I mean, I know I'm being a little, <laughs> I'm being a little, you know, panty waste by asking that. Like, oh, what a nerdish move on your part, Neil. You can't just like assume that you can order a meal. You have to ask and clarify. Like, are you sure it's just for lunch, or can I use it for dinner, sir? Huh. Anyway, fifty dollars worth of Chinese food can last you a lifetime. We ordered that shit on Friday night it's now wednesday night and we still have a little bit left not bad we got to string it out a little bit so i'm probably have like msg just pouring out of me out of every orifice but worth it totally worth it because i get to reimburse you know submit the receipt get that 50 dollars back and then that same chinese restaurant because i was like $50 $50 worth of food. I don't want to like get sushi because it's overpriced. I'm sorry if you're in the sushi biz. That shit's overpriced. Okay. $50 of sushi, that's nothing. That's a roll, roll and a half. So I was like, I want to get my, a lot of bang for my buck. And then I saw this Chinese restaurant, Joy Walk. I think it's in Wayne or Totowa. You know, they're just, they're offering crazy discounts. Here, here's $10 off. So I was like, whoa, I got $10 off and I can order $50 worth of food. I'm going to I'm gonna go hog wild on this Chinese right here. So hot and sour soup, Kung Pao chicken, curry chicken, spring roll. Well, we had a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I think I got another one. What else did I get? A shit ton of rice. I mean, they give you so much goddamn white rice. Like, what, what, what's the deal there? It also makes me think that Joy Walk doesn't have like any other form of business right now. Like, there's no dine-in for them. They're not setting up shop outside. I get. I just got another 
email saying, Hey, how about another $10 off joy walk? And I'm like, joy walk, what are you doing to me? What are you trying to do to me right now? Are you poisoning me? Is this food, has this expired? Is it spoiled? It's like when you see a special, I'm, I'm, I'm woke to specials now. You're offering me a special. Why is it special? Yeah. Well, what's going on? You're trying to unload, You're trying to unload some last minute food that's about to expire. What's going on? What's with that special? No one's buying it. So you're going to, you're going to drop it down, discount, call it special. No, I'm not buying it. <clears throat> but yeah, what was the other one? Compound chicken, mushu chicken, which can get sloppy. My wife apparently has never had mushu chicken. I found that very, that was an eye opener for me. Never? Mushu? Never? She's like, oh, she watched me do it, watched me put it together. She's like, oh, it's just like Asian fajitas. And I'm like, yeah, that's one way to put it. <laughs> she also called, <laughs> she also called Biggie, <laughs> uh, she also called Tupac West Coast Biggie. <laughs> it's not a bad clue where, you know, when you're playing heads up. Speaking of heads up, well, Friday night, so I watch episode five of The Boys. And mm, I would say not as good as episode four. I think it's still a good episode. There were there was one moment in the show where I was like, oh shit. I think I know what I think you know that I know. If you've seen the episode five of the boys that came out on Friday, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Homelander. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When he goes and he drops in unexpected. At that rally, mm -hmm. yeah, that that scene, that's the one that legitimately got my jaw to go drop it to the floor, drop it to the floor, bend down and touch your knees to your elbows. That's what my jaw did when I saw that scene, and I decided to, like stay up and put off sleep to watch the first episode of Hoops on Netflix. It it's an irreverent animated comedy and basically Netflix saw the success of Big Mouth and they saw the comedic gem that is Jake Johnson from is it Jake Johnson oh boy I hope it is Jake Johnson he was Nick on the new girl I love Jake Johnson I mean it just everything he does is just great except drinking buddies that was a weird one I don't know if I like drinking buddies it hit just it hit too real for me oh. Uh, but hoops and man it came out firing <laughs> the first scene first couple scenes and it just never let up and uh it's nice to have something like that back in my life so i'll probably continue to watch that it's definitely more hardcore than f is for family and it really just I mean, like Big Mouth, you know, it's profane, explicit. This is just a whole nother level. This is just debauched. <laughs> this is just debauchery. Lewd, lascivious, just filth. And I love it. And I love Jake Johnson. So I'll probably give it a nice, I'll probably give it a go. But, you know, it was it was one and done. I couldn't I couldn't invest in like a whole, you know, binge at like one o'clock in the morning on a Friday. It's like, I still got responsibilities that uh, I can't shirk all the time, you know? But this past weekend, we went to some friends' uh, place nearby. They have a daughter who's about four months younger than our daughter. And it was, it was jolting to see the difference between our two daughters. <laughs> the two daughters. Our daughter, their daughter. We get there, their daughter's napping. So our daughter has just woke up from a nap, and so she's raring to go. She's all engines are online, and, you know, energy is at a 1,000%. So she comes in. We walk into the living room, and they, the, 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 our friends, the one friend had built this humongous tower of Legos in their living room. And... <laughs> It took my daughter maybe a minute, two minutes to just knock that shit right down. I mean, this was like, 
definitely taller than six feet. I would say it was a seven foot tower of Legos, Lego tower, beautiful, beautiful Lego tower, just perfect in every way. I, I even asked when we first got there, holy macaroni, dude, how long did this take you to make this Lego tower? He's like, ah, you know, day, couple days. I'm thinking to myself, it's a lot of time to put into something. And when she knocked that shit down, when she pushed that over with so much glee and happiness in her face and in her, in her body, I could see a little part of him died. And I was like, oh my God, I'm, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, she's just, she's a menace. I don't know what to do with her. Like, she's crazy. And are you upset? Are you mad? Like, what, what are you feeling right now? He's like, God, <laughs> it's fine. You know, that, that little like pained, panged, like chuckle, chortle of like, uh, you know, <laughs> I put so much time and effort and sweat into that. And like, you know, he probably did it for his daughter that was napping. And she didn't even get to see it in all its glory. Great. Thanks. My daughter. And, you know, it was just, it was, it was like that for the rest of the time that we were there. You know, the, their daughter wa wakes up and is just like super chill, just casually strolling about the living room. Just kind of like checking in with everyone. Hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. My daughter's just running around, like taking any toy that the, their daughter picked up, which is her toy. All the toys in there are her toys. My daughter would go over and just snatch it from her from her grasp. And the other daughter would totally cool with it. Just like, oh, oh, okay, you want to play with that? It's cool. I'll just go play with this. And then she would go play with something else. And my daughter would go over, snatch that from her. And then we would be like, you can't keep doing that. Like that's mean. You gotta share. And so we would try and we would take it back and she would immediately decompensate, bury her head. She likes to do this where she just collapses on the floor. And like pretty much headbutts the floor every time and then cries for a little bit. And then I don't know if she gets over it, but that was just on loop all day where like their chill daughter was so cool about everything. Didn't cry once. I don't think and was just that their daughter was just watching our daughter while out, just like lose her mind and run around and be a, a crazy woman. And she was, and she was just like, whoa, this is, is this how I'm supposed to act? Is this like, am I learning? Is this, what is this right now? But, you know, they got along and they, they get along eventually. And, you know, they were, they got to go in that remote, con you know, last episode, I talked about this remote control car that uh, her grandparents got for her. And so they got to ride in the car outside in the lawn for like an hour straight. and. All's well. Of course, the their daughter was like constantly trying to turn the car off because she's like, I don't know, I don't think I want to be in this car with this lunatic next to me, <laughs> this saint lunatic <laughs> riding shoddy or having control of the wheel. Uh, and uh, yeah, I totally understand that. But so they constantly trying to turn it off, and then you know, eventually. My my daughter, our daughter, got into such a, a groove and was like, I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna kick things up a notch. And so she would start hopping and jumping in the car, which then, you know, peer pressured <laughs> their daughter into doing the same. And uh yeah, it was it was it was a, a very close to being a trip to the ER. Let's say that. But good times had by all. This was like Brielle's birthday part three. We're already we're already grooming her to have the stereotypical cliche like ladies' birthday. Women have birthdays for an entire month, you know, because they got to celebrate with this these people one weekend and these people the other weekend and these people. So we're we're she's in a good spot right now to learn how to take full advantage of that. We had a. Uh, our friends surprised us, surprised us with a pumpkin beer blind taste test. So I, I don't think I've had many pumpkin beers thus far, which is interesting because they usually start rolling out in the liquor stores in like late August and people just look like, you know, they, they go all coronavirus level pandemic, uh, you know, impulse shopping, bulk shopping 
when they see those pumpkin beers and just in and and clear the shelves. So uh, I haven't really had many opportunities to drink pumpkin beer, but man, God, I love pumpkin beer. So goddamn good. And uh, so we they gave us a blind taste taste test and. So I had, uh, before we did the blind taste test, I had a, a Southern Tier Pumpkin, which is one of my favorites, or so I thought, and a Schlafly, Schlafly, which is pretty good. And then there were some others I didn't really get into. But the blind taste test, so we had four beers. There were four of us. So we have four beers to, that are not, no labels. They're in glasses, not, no way to identify them. And we had to taste, sip each one. We had to mark down which one we, you know, rank them from one, you know, one to four. And then also try and guess which one is which. You know, actually they tell us what the four beers are. So it turns out the four beers are Whole Hog Pumpkin Ale, Southern Tier Pumpkin, Schlafly, and then Dogfish Head, which I've, you know, Straight up, like I've never been a fan of anything that Dogfish Head has ever done, <laughs> so uh, you can imagine where that ended up on on my list. But almost consensus, universal across the board. Number one, number four was Dogfish Head. I mean, it's just like it's right in the name. Like, why would I ever want to have anything related to a dog or a fish and a head in my mouth, like at a, at any point? So that was dead last, pretty much for everyone. And then three was actually pumpkin, which was like the biggest surprise of the night. The fact that, that, you know, we all, it's always been hailed as like, this is one of the premier pumpkin beers that everyone tends to call out when they, when it's like pumpkin beers. Oh, oh, pumpkin. And that ended up third. And then Schlafly's two and then whole hog, which I, I forgot I actually had, but, uh, is just the aroma alone is what sold me on it. Like you can just smell it and be like, ah, that's good enough for me. Like <laughs> I don't even need to to drink that. I'm good with just sniffing that, and I and I feel I feel relaxed, and I feel like all my worries have gone away. So, whole hog is the is your pumpkin beer blind taste test champion, and uh, you know, do your own taste test. I don't know, call me out. But pumpkin being three is interesting. You know, you you take the label off. And you drink and you're like, oh, this is, this is spicy. What is this? This is spicy. And it's like, no, this is pumpkin. This is the thing you've been drinking for the past two hours. <laughs> you think you'd be able to identify it. But anyone who knows me knows my taste buds uh, packed their bags and took and went on a, a permanent hiatus <laughs> back in the day. We uh, ended up playing a couple games. Hoopla is a game I've never played before, but it feels a little bit like cranium. Uh, cranium. You got a like dice, something that you roll it has four or five sides. There are four or five colors. You know, you got your yeah, nothing special. I mean, you got alliteration. So one is alliteration where you got to begin your clue for what you get. These cards, right? There's a who, a what, a where, who, what, where. I don't think they do when or why or how. <laughs> it's just who, what, when. And you decide, you roll a dice, you have to pick, it, it lands on a color, that color corresponds with what you have to do. Yellow is alliteration, so you got to give clues that all begin with the same letter as to what your card is, and other people guess. There's obviously the one where you draw, cloodle, I think it is, you got to doodle the clue. There's a, uh, oof. Tweener, which was a weird one. That's where it's like, this is bigger than this, but smaller than this. And people cheat on that one. That, I mean, like, people cheat. And we have to be honest with ourselves and with each other. People cheat. And there's no greater example of that as humans than Tweener in this, in this game Hoopla because it, it's like bigger than, people will say bigger than this and smaller than this, and you're like, hmm. I know what you're talking about, but that's neither of those statements are true. And then I think the last one was, oh, uh, like charades. But you can make sounds, which I thought was uh, an interesting twist. Like you act it out, but I'm, I'm like, I really pride myself on sound effects. I'm not really a Michael Winslow-esque level 
type sound effect guy, but I like making sounds. So that was right up my uh, alley. So we played that for a little bit. And then Heads Up, which uh, we didn't know if in this current climate, you know, with Ellen and her show, the Ellen show, having such a toxic environment and, you know, we weren't sure if the the climate was okay to play Heads Up considering it's an Ellen DeGeneres game, but we pushed through it. <laughs> we decided, yeah, okay, I think we can all come to terms with this. We're doing it for us. We're not doing it for her. We're just, we're not going to buy any decks, okay? We're not going to contribute to her toxicity. And uh, we strictly played the 90s deck. That's all we did. 90s, 90s, 90s. And uh, man, it's probably a good thing that those videos don't, that we didn't save any of those videos or share any of those videos. I mean, they were fucking hilarious in the moment, but I'm pretty sure for most groups and parties, the, the day after you watch that and you're just like, we were a disaster. <laughs> and then we, I decided that we weren't trying to figure out what to watch. And cause you know, you get all gamed out after a while. And I remember that Supermarket Sweep is on Netflix. We ended up turning on Supermarket Sweep. And I, you didn't really, like when Supermarket Sweep was on originally, I was a kid. So 8, 9, 10 probably is when I, when I was in its heyday. And I remember love, I loved watching it. Watching it now as a jaded, cynical, dickhead adult, all I could think was, this is just one big advertisement. <laughs> That's all I could think about. Was like all these, this game is just like all these sponsors decide that they're going to like, you know, I mean, what a genius idea from the, from the network. First of all, it's just go to a bunch of brands and be like, hey, we can very organically plug your brand for the low, low cost of whatever and make it look like it's part of a game show. <laughs> and the brands were like, uh, yeah, this is amazing. <laughs> Cause you watch it now and you're like, Oh, okay. So that brand, 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 that brand. got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. So. <sighs> boy. Oh boy. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to watch it now as an adult. And that's what happens, you know? You lose your childlike wonder. You can see through all the bullshit. Never grow old. It's like the and friggin' Billy Madison where he just grabs that fat kid's face and shakes and he's like, don't get old. Never get old. Um, the next day we had lunch with uh, my father-in-law and his girlfriend. We had a little barbecue. We had barbecue over at our friend's place. And then we had barbecue the next day. And the beauty of the barbecue is that it was this little kind of mom and pop small shop place in a, in a small town, <laughs> which this sounds like a Bruce Springsteen or a John Mellencamp song, but <laughs> no indoor seating, right? So we had to sit out outside. And fun fact, you know what? Who loves barbecue more than me? Bees. There were bees everywhere. Just constantly hovering around our daughter's pretty little face. Just just teasing us like, who am I going to sting, huh? Who the fuck am I going to sting right now, huh? Could it be you? Could it be you? I could sting all of you. And we're like, no, oh, actually you sting once and you die. And he's like, ah, oh, motherfucker. We evolved. So... Yeah, that was fun trying to swat off bees as I'm enjoying my barbecue. A little brisket, a little pulled pork, fried pickles with that like creamy horseradish type sauce with that I could I could like I know it's gross and disgusting. I'm not arguing with you on that, but I could drink a whole gallon of that shit. It's so good. Uh and we we got some ice cream. We went to the place that my my wife used to work. And here's a little uh, story about how the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. My wife, Cassie, and her father, 
They're both, we're, we're all there. All four of us, we're all looking at this ice cream shop. We're ordering through that, you know, little takeout window on the glass partition that separates us from the, the, uh, Clark, whatever you want to call it. There's the menu. And then there's, Hey, we're out of all these flavors. So what does my wife and her father do? They both stare and stare and stare and stare. And they're like, all right, we're ready to order. And they both order flavors that are clearly not in stock. <laughs> like it says, it's right in front of your face. We are out of these flavors. And then they, the beauty is like, they'll ask, hey, are you out of this? And it's like, well, if you can use your eyeballs, yeah. And that's where I've never been good at customer service or being a waiter or server or, you know, work the cashier or any kind of thing where I have to interact with people on a regular basis that are just not using their faculties. So, um, we went around the corner and, and, uh, enjoyed our ice cream. I got the chocolate, the chocolate peanut butter, which I always do, which is, I know I just can't branch out. I can't. I can't do it. But uh my our daughter just just got straight up dirty. <laughs> we, there was like gravel and dirt and and I mean literally we we just get to the spot where we're eating and a minute later, minute later, I look at her and she's just covered in she looked like one of the chimney sweeps from Mary Poppins. She's just covered in soot and dirt and just like other materials that I didn't even know existed. And it's just like, "Whoa, boy. You are a literal tornado." Um, but there was uh, this one statue of like a Native American with a dog. And for some reason, it was pointing towards the corner of the building. Like it was not facing out. It's like someone was, it like it was in timeout. They had done something wrong. And, you know, or maybe it was some kind of symbolic gesture. But this statue was not facing with the front towards everyone. It was the front was towards this brick corner of the building. And... I don't know if this was like for bulk trash collection or what. Someone's trying to get rid of a decoration, thinking it's offensive or something. But this Native American uh, covered its front parts, but not the back. So it was kind of like a hospital gown, just like uh, open in the back to let the sun shine down on the moon, if you will. And my daughter couldn't get enough of that. <laughs> she was just poking at it and sticking her finger up there and just, oof. And, you know, I think we kind of have to, as parents, we kind of have to look at ourselves and say, hey, maybe we're responsible for this kind of butt play. You know, we kind of have a fascination with her butt. It's kind of hard not to pinch. I know that's, we're not getting her consent. So that's like me too all over again. But yeah, she might have a butt problem. She also might have a foot thing going on because my wife, Constantly trying to eat her feet. So who knows what kind of lifelong fetishes and quirks we just have instilled in our daughter in the short, short time span of two years. So that's life, y'all. What are you going to do? Let's talk TV. Let's talk about the Emmys. I did not watch the Emmys. So <laughs> if, you were, if you were hoping for a full-on a comprehensive breakdown of the Emmys. No, I didn't watch. And uh, apparently a lot of people didn't watch. <clears throat> I think it had its lowest ratings ever. 6.1 million viewers. What I find interesting about the Emmys, and we'll get to it in a little bit, but it's just kind of like dominated by one or two shows. It feels like that's the case pretty much almost every year, maybe. This year, HBO had 30 goddamn wins. Succession won for Outstanding Drama, Directing, Writing, Lead Actor, uh, Jeremy Strong, Casting, Watchmen won for Outstanding Limited Series, Yaya Abdul-Mateen II won for Supporting Actor. It also won for Writing, Lead Actress Regina King, Well-Deserved, Cinematography, Costumes, Music, Casting, and um, yeah. I mean, if, you, if you're like an OG giant mess fan of which there are none 
you would have known that like I was pushing for Watchmen to win a bunch of Emmys because it's just uh, a show that we have not that basically takes the best elements of all your favorite award-winning shows and smushed it into one package. That is what she said. Rick and Morty actually won for the Vat of Acid episode, which I believe I reviewed in a previous episode. I really like the Vat of, Ap- Vat of Acid episode. So even if you're not a Rick and Morty fan, I think you can watch it and appreciate it on its own. So if you're looking at wins by program... Watchmen had 11 wins. Schitt's Creek cleaned up with nine wins. Well-deserved. Succession had seven. Mandalorian had seven. Hell yeah, season two coming back at you real quick. RuPaul's Jag Race continues to win, which is okay. Saturday Night Live had six wins. Last week with uh, John Oliver had four. Mrs. Maisel had four, which we watched like the first season and maybe the start of the second season, and I just, I don't know. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like it's a good show. Just not for me, I guess. Dave Chappelle won three for his special Sticks and Stones. And uh, if you're going wins by network, HBO led with 11. Pop TV, which is Schitt's Creek, went uh, had seven. And uh, the news now is that Schitt's Creek will be coming to Comedy Central. And I don't know if that means like because Schitt's Creek already aired their final season, right? Yeah, on Pop TV. But I guess the reruns will be coming to Comedy Central, so they can get a whole lot more of Comedy Central, which was now available on YouTube TV, thank God, even though I haven't even watched it yet, because it seems like every time I go by past Comedy Central, it's just like reruns of The Office and South Park. I mean, I'm not hating on it, but it's like, can you mix in something new? Netflix had two wins. Apple TV had a win. FX and VH1 also had a win. And that's it. One, two, three, four, five, six networks. That's that's kind of jarring, isn't it? With only six networks out of all the goddamn channels that we have. <laughs> only six networks have uh, Emmys. Truly mind-bottling. So yeah, that's my that's my Emmys reaction. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm kind of off of award shows now. I just, I don't think I miss much. I think they used to be a much bigger deal. And now that they're more like virtual, uh, you know, I, I talked to my wife about it a little bit earlier today. And it's just like, it's not even based on, uh, most of the awards are like bullshit. It's very like seldom or occasional that you will see an award that's given to someone that it, it's like deserved and earned and like for that particular project or performance. Parasite. I mean, like overwhelmingly, yes, that was the best picture. But you think about like certain actors that have been snubbed over the years and then they end up winning an award for a performance in a movie that's like no one really saw or like, values and it's just like well we gave it to him because fuck he deserved it every other year but there was just a better performance the other year so you know i had got my thoughts and my feelings about awards and ultimately it feels like those awards end up buying you employment for for the next five years maybe say next five years so I make mean, it see why you'd want to win an award because it's like you're given the benefit of the doubt for the next five maybe 10 years i don't know i'm being a little too uh liberal with that but oh boy the emmys i don't think i've ever actually watched an emmys to be honest this fucking computer is going to shit all right, so let's talk the Mets. I, I, you know, I had a whole diatribe planned out about breaking down playoff odds, looking at schedules, and maybe I'll still talk about it. But uh, as I'm sitting here recording this episode, it's the bottom of the ninth. There's one out, two guys on. Tampa is up eight to two. Familia imploded, Shreve imploded, 
they brought in Mats for a little bit. He gave up a ding dong. So it's looking like with this loss that uh, the hopes and dreams or postseason hopes and dreams are probably in the shitter. But I will explore some scenarios with you just in case. Uh, barring tonight's loss, which it looks like it's going to be a loss. The Mets have been 3-3 three and three playing 500 ball. I said if they wanted a realistic chance, or many people have said if they want a realistic chance to make the playoffs, they would have to play about well over 600 ball, meaning they'd have to win, you know, every, every three-game series, they need to win two. And instead, you know, they'll win two or three here, but then they'll lose two or three there. So, you know, I was recording the last uh, that last game against the Phillies when they had the comeback win, which was huge, and then they come back the next night, and they get the their dick kicked in, 15-2. Matt's. I mean, Steven Matz needs a vacation, <laughs> a long, long vacation. He, two and two-thirds, eight hits, six earned runs. Franklin Kilome, who we've talked about possibly being in this, a young arm in the starting rotation is what we said last week. One inning and a third, three hits, six earned, three walks. Jared Hughes, the mad dog, has been god-awful over the past two weeks, maybe even three weeks. Three and two-thirds, six hits, three earned. And then uh, at least we have one dependable arm in our bullpen. Todd, the Todd father, Frazier. One inning pitch, zero runs, one K. You know? I wouldn't put it past if we were in the hunt and, and you actually needed an inning. Oh, Todd, for, and speaking of Todd, he just went yard. So now we're looking at a, an 8-5 ball game in the bottom of the ninth. So we're down by three. Who knows? Maybe they got a little more magic left in them. Uh, we come back the next night, and we win 7-2. Peterson gives us another great outing. Six innings pitch, three hits, one earned. One earned run, 10 Ks. Robbie Cano looking good, three for four, three ribbies. And then the next night, uh, next day, we have the, I think this is the black smoke game. Is this the black smoke game or is it Friday? I don't know. One of the games there was just black smoke. And so everyone had jokes on Twitter. It's the next, the next Pope. <laughs> They're announcing the next Pope, Mets Pope, I guess. <coughs> but uh, we get shut out, seven nothing. And for once, and you look at that score and you think, oh, Porcello had another shit outing. He, like, you know, he dookied the bed yet again. No. And a nay, nay, nay. Seven innings pitched is it arguably his best start. Seven innings pitched, three hits, one earned run, 10 Ks. Familia comes in, does Familia things, two earned runs. Chase and Shreve, who usually is has been dependable up until the past week or so, two weeks, gives up three earned runs, and it looks like a blowout when in reality it's, you know, through seven. It was close. So I think with that that loss on Sunday, a lot of people were like, all right, that's we're pretty much done zo at that point. Three games set against the Rays in New York. I thought they were gonna go to Tampa. They didn't they they stay here in Queens. And we lose a tight one, two one. We had opportunities to win, couldn't pull it out. Big win against, uh, I mean, we had DeGrom on the mound. He he strikes out 10 through 7. And uh, it was, I think it's like, they were saying on the broadcast, it's the first time that starting pitchers have had three consecutive outings with 10 Ks. So you had Peterson, Porcello, and DeGrom with 10 Ks each. But I think it happened like last year with the Astros or something like that. Um, So... The ground gives us another gem. We obviously can't give him run support, so he ends up with the loss. 5-2 win was huge. Uh, I forget who started that game. But you you see wins like that, and you think to yourself, okay, maybe this is what's going to turn us around. It's this stop-start, herky-jerky type of play that is has been so maddening for Mets fans, you know, that we can look so good one night and then next night looked just like we have never played baseball before. I'm trying to find the tweet here. I think it's down below. 
someone named Star Blazer on Twitter. The Rays play baseball. They steal bases. They knock runners in from third. They knock balls down to prevent runs. They catch balls in the outfield. They do all the little things. The Mets do none of those things, which is pretty much a great summation summary of this this Mets Rays series because the Rays are widely considered to be, you know, a favorite to go to the World Series after what they've done this season. And the Mets have, I'm not a huge baseball knowledge guy. I know the Mets. Mets are my team. I know the Mets. I'm looking at the Rays team, and I'm like, I don't know pretty much any of these dudes. And they're going to win the AL East, and they're like now favorites to go to the World Series. But you watch them, and there's nothing that really stands out to you about them other than they just play correct fundamental fundies, as Keith Hernandez likes to say. They got fundies. And they do the little things that you need to win. Like like note memo to Pete Alonzo, when you have the bases loaded, you got to get runs in. <laughs> you can't fly out. Uh, you know, you can't strike out. You need to get a, at least a run in. And that's been, you know, I mean, with bases loaded, it's like we're lucky to get one run when, you know, really um, we should be getting multiples in. So... And that's the ball game. So Rays beat the Mets 8-5, pretty much putting the final nail in the coffin for the Mets 2020 season, which is super disappointing because, I mean, I had them going like 40-20. and 20. <laughs> And Baseball Reference had that as well. I don't know if I have this down here. Yeah, so Baseball Reference had a 90% confidence level that our best record when we started the season in late July would be 40 and 20. And, uh, you know, I should have put money on it. I mean, I did put money on it. I put money on them winning the division. I put money winning the, on them winning the National League. I put money on them winning the World Series because I just thought 60-game sprint with this talent, you know, with a long season, you have so many injuries and slumps and streaks. I thought, okay, two months, we got this. We'll, we're going to put our two best months forward. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna clean up. And instead, guess what? Our the the ninety percent. So that was best case scenario was forty and twenty, which I thought was was right within our reach. So Baseball Reference had ninety percent confidence that our worst case record would be twenty seven and thirty three. And I mean that could very easily happen if we decide to just completely, uh, you know, split with the Nats. So. But, you know, it has been kind of a worst case scenario. Yoenis Cespedes opts out after less than two weeks. Marcus Stroman opts out without throwing a goddamn pitch. Injuries. Guys not performing to their just their average. Porcello and Waka not giving you quality outings. Having to move Lugo from the from the closer role into the starting role. You know, the lack of clutch hitting. I mean, you know, it really was the worst case scenario. So uh, I think this has to be, you know, even though it is one of the shortest seasons, it is the shortest season that they've ever played. It's got to be the most disappointing in my mind. Has to be. Has to be. I mean, you know, understandably, the Braves are or forced to, to be reckoned with. I downplayed them when the before the season started. I thought that they weren't going to be at the level that they were in previous years, and they proved me dead wrong. I think they're 33 and 22, 34 and 22, 35 and 22 now. So, I mean, we can take a look at the playoff scenarios. Dodgers are just like, are right where the Mets should be at 39 and 16. Padres uh, clinched a wild card, and I think that's the team that I'm probably pulling for in the playoffs in the National League, Padres. Braves have clinched the East. Cubbies are currently in first in the Central, and this, the Central is like haywire right now. <laughs> I mean, you know, as it stands, the Cardinals, who are currently losing to the Royals, 
Um, they have five left against the Brewers, and then there'd still be two games short. And this is where I was trying to wrap my head. I had to do, I had to do, put on my thinking cap and my research gloves and go on, go on the Googs and figure out what the fuck is going on with this Cardinal season because there's no way they can just play 58 games and make the playoffs in this tight a race. You know, they're, they're one up in the, uh, in the wild card. Uh, well, I guess that they're, that this is where it gets weird. So you have the first place teams that automatically get clinch a playoff spot. Then you have the second place teams that automatically clinch. And then you have like the two wild cards. Is that how I'm reading it? Yeah, I guess. Right? Maybe. I don't know. So St. Louis is currently in second, losing to the Royals. Then they have to play five against the Braves. They're two and three against the Brewers so far. Or they have to play five against the Brewers. And they're two and three against Milwaukee so far which leads me to believe that they're not exactly sitting pretty just yet, even though they're, they're just one game above, above 500. So say this plays out, the only scenario where they play 58 and wouldn't have to play the final two is if they were already eliminated from the playoffs or if they were so far ahead that it's like every other one else is eliminated. That is certainly not the case here. So I, you know, it's looking like they're going to have to play like a double header on that Monday against Detroit, which I don't even know what Detroit's doing this year. I assume that they're not doing great. So it's very, very possible that the Brewers take it to them and leapfrog the the Cardinals in the wild card race in the standings as well, which be a, which would be a huge boon for us. Um. I don't know what the, I think the Braves and Marlins were tied last time I checked in, but the the Marlins are about a half game up, so they're second place in the East, and they have the final game against the Braves tonight, which they could lose that, and then they got three against the Yankees. The Yankees are on a dead sprint to try and get to try and get to the postseason, so I think they're going to be playing their their best ball. Very, the Marlins could very easily get swept there. So now you're looking at. They'd be 28 and 31, right? Do they have two left against the Braves? Maybe they have two left against the Braves. So who knows there? And then the Reds have three against the Twins, which the Twins are, uh, you know, have a lot of people in the American League worried. So it's very, the Reds could get swept. The uh, we talked about the Brewers, how they could. I, if I have to like lay some money down on who I think is, uh, you know, going to make some moves in this final couple games, I think the Brewers are that team. Giants are at five hundred. They have the Rockies and the Padres. The Rockies are like kind of in the hunt. They're three games back of the wild card, but I doubt. I mean, they would have to. The Rockies would have to. I don't know what the Rockies would have to do, honestly. But the the Giants have the Rockies and Padres. Who knows what the Padres, what their game plan is down the down the stretch? Because they've already clinched a spot, so maybe they let their foot off the gas, and that would allow the Giants to 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 clinch. The Phillies are really shit the bed. I mean, they they got swept in the doubleheader against the Nats, and then I think they're they're losing again tonight against the Nats. So, and then they have three against the Rays, who I believe the Rays might have clinched the AL East, but they even the Rays, when they're playing at half, 50%, they're still beating te- quality teams. So I think the Phillies are probably out of it, and then there's us. You know, we got four remaining against the Nats. So we're at 25 and 31, right? Say we sweep the Nats, we go 29 and 31. We would need, like, the Reds to shit the beds. Reds to shit the beds. <laughs> We need the Reds to shit the bed. We would need the Phillies to get swept by the Rays, not out of the realm of possibilities. And you would need, it's possible, the Marlins. Like, do we own, that's the that's the thing, though. I don't know what the head-to-head record is. Against the against the Marlins, we have a losing record against the Phillies, but I don't think we have to worry about the Phillies. And then we're like four and six against the Phillies, but I think the Phillies 
we're going to end up with a better record than them. It's the Marlins that I don't, I'm not sure about. So, I mean, we were at 6% heading into the night. We're probably back to like 3 or 1% now. Um, but this is it. All you can do is win out. And you go 29-31 <laughs> possibly make the playoffs. But you have the Dodgers, Braves, Cubs are in. Padres are in, which means you have uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, you have four more spots open. And if I have to guess who those four spots are going to be, I'm going to say Brewers. Brewers, Giants. Mm. Mets. Brewers, Giants, Mets. Cardinals? I don't know. <sighs> boy, oh boy. So, yeah, that's tough. Turns out that, uh, so, even though Cohen and the Wilpons have agreed on a sale of the team, SMY was not part of the sale, but it turns out that Cohen will now have an exclusive window to bid on SMY. Um, according to Forbes, after the vote in November, when the uh, I think the owners, the 30 whatever owners, he needs like 23 votes from the other owner, 23 other owners to approve to approve the sale. He'll have a, a window of 30 days after that vote if it if it's yes, which I you know I think it should be to bid on SNY, and he'll he'll be able to buy it at a fucking bargain because originally it was supposed to be like two bills, something like that, and now it's going to be around one million. <laughs> the Wilpons have to be kicking themselves. So curious to know what he would be doing with SNY. Um, I just, I, I remember like, is it Nesson? I I grew up in like the Boston area and I remember Nesson having a good broadcast almost every time, uh, Jerry Remy and I forget who, but they just have personalities like Eck, Eckersley. He's got a personality on him. You watch like, and I, you know, I'm being super critical and I really shouldn't. And I love Todd Zeal, love Nelson Figuora. But they just don't do it for me, you know? It's just like, and Gary Apple is Gary Apple. He's just kind of like, I don't know. They just need, they need to bring back the players that have personality. I'd throw, fuck it, throw Lenny, throw nails out there. <laughs> throw Lenny Dykstra in the mix. Just give us something like, you know, you, you have Poppy for the Red Sox, and he's and he has that accent, and he's talking about, da, Jenkins loose. And it's just like, we don't have that in the post game. The post game is just hard, hard to watch sometimes. Even after a win, because it's like, yeah, you know, he, he, he threw a slider here, and then he threw like a fastball, and he took it the other way, and he like really stayed on this, and I, it's just like, can we please get someone in there who just has a little bit of pep in their step? So uh, maybe he'll he'll be able to overhaul S and Y and make it a must watch program because I mean, you know, Gary Keith and Ron. The in-game broadcast is phenomenal. It's just like the pre-game and post-game is just kind of hard to to like. It's just like white noise in the background for me. Harsh much? Yeah, sorry. Uh, so there are rumors now that Cohen's first move is to buy out Yankees GM Brian Cashman, which I am all in on. Problem is he is in the middle of a five-year, $25 million deal that won't expire until 2022, but there is a potential loophole in this situation. And then that's when ESPN plus or whatever the fuck they're calling their paywall service was like, give us money. And I said, nah. So who knows what that potential loophole is? <laughs> Maybe you can Google it and find it out, but wouldn't that be a steal? <sighs> that would be a huge steal. Of course, there were also rumors that Theo Epstein might be in the mix. It just seems like everyone's on the table at this point. When you have that much cash pouring out your ace, Everyone is a possibility. So Steve Cohen is weighing the possibility of bringing back Sandy Alderson in an advisory role. 
should he gain, should uh, Cohen gain control as principal owner? One source said that if that occurred, he expected Allison to try to make a push to have Paul De Batista return in an uh, important role as well. If that name sounds familiar, De Batista was at one point like the GM of the Browns, <laughs> and I remember the Browns got crucified for that because it's like, why are you hiring a baseball sabermetric statistician to be your to run your football operations? But you know, it's the Browns. Why not? Steve Cohen was also in line to buy the Dodgers in 2011, and was named then powerful agent Arn Tellum, which is such a like agent name Arn tell him hey Arn why don't you tell him Arn tell him go tell him Arn uh as team president hired GM beneath tell him but the deal with the Dodgers did not go through tell him is now vice chairman of the Detroit Pistons and a source said it was possible that Cohen could loan him to the Mets I don't know that I want another fucking agent how about that I think you know not to <laughs> not to uh <sighs> discriminate be a bigot against agents. I'm not anti-agent, but it's it's kind of tough to go back to back agents like that, <laughs> you know, because we've seen what this agent has done. He's favored all his former clients, given them sweetheart deals, and it's really fucked us over. And he's he's absolutely absolutely pillaged and ravaged our minor league system, especially our pitching prospects. So, not exactly high in bringing on another agent Matthew Brownstein who also who always gives out some sweet stats on Twitter he said since 2019 Jacob deGrom has recorded seven starts with at least 25 swings and misses and that's the most such regular season starts in the majors Jarrett Jarrett Garrett Cole is second with five I, I mean I'll never get tired of Jacob deGrom stats it's just a, it's a travesty. It's a crime against humanity that he does not get more wins. <laughs> I mean, you know, how many teams could you pitch for where you give us seven innings and 14 Ks and you get the loss? How many other fucking teams does that happen on? And that's, to, and that's not like, oh, that was like his best performance of the year. It's just like, that's him. That's average DeGrom. And we we still can't get him wins. It's just uh, it's bananas. Was that the game? That might have been the game where the the Rays just threw out like eight their their entire bullpen. They didn't have a starter. They had an opener and then just all these relievers. I think that was the game. And it's just like, oh my god. When you see that, I mean, typically that happens with teams like the Rockies who are just like, we don't have any starting arms, and the starting arms that we do have refuse to go out on the mound. So for fear of getting pounded and, and suffering traumatic you know, trauma. So it's unusual to see. I mean, we did it once in college, and it actually worked in our favor. And, I, and I'm wondering why the Mets just don't, why they didn't try and like maybe give that a shot more often as opposed to like, let's have, we'll, we'll, we'll toss Gesellman out in the bump for three innings and he'll get knocked around. And, you know, why not just have, I mean, we have enough dudes out in that pen. <laughs> just have one guy per inning, you know? Louis Rojas said Dell and Batances hit a lat injury from the Mets for a month. Batances has been on the injured list with rat, right lat tightness since August 30th. And he revealed to team officials at the time he was sidelined that he had been dealing with a lat issue since he pitched in Boston. And it, uh, yeah, I mean, Ross said the Mets hope he can, uh, Batances can return before the season ends, but uh, it's probably not looking good. He is a, Batances has a 6.10 ERA, a 1.65 whip in 13 appearances in his first year with the team after pitching in just one game for the Yankees in 2019 because of a series of injuries. And in 2021, Batances has a $6 million player option or $3 million buyout if he declines the option. So, either way, God damn it. Another horrific, this is one of the two moves, uh, a, a, another one of the two moves that Brody Van Wagen has made that has really fucked us over. 
and then it's cost us games. And, um, you know, it, as if the list of incriminating offenses hasn't been long enough, you can add Dell and Batances to the list. I mean, you know, and I wasn't expecting him to be back to where he was as dominant as he was with the Yankees back in the day, but I was expecting better than a 6.10 ERA in only 13 appearances over 60 games. You know, 10 and a third innings in 60 games. I expected a little bit more than that. I mean, you, you can't really blame me for getting my hopes up about this Mets team before the season started. All the names that we have, and it just goes to show you, The names don't mean Doc. <laughs> it's about how you play on the field, and I think the Tampa Bay Rays have proven that. So the other, the other damning piece of evidence against Brody Van Wagenen in the case against BBW is Jake Marisnik. Uh, this headline, the headline was Jake Marisnik injury exposes another Brody Van Wagenen mistake. The Mets traded prospects Blake Taylor and Kennedy Corona for the 29-year-old Mersnick, who received just 33 at-bats and appeared in just 16 games this season. Taylor, meanwhile, has pitched well the bullpen for the Strohs, notching a 2.41 ERA over 18 and two-thirds with 16 strikeouts. Mersnick actually has hit better than expected, hitting two homers and driving in five runs, going 11 for 33, but he just couldn't stay healthy. Mersnick has not ruled out a return, but I feel like pass, maybe? Maybe pass on that. I think, you know, he's probably a last resort at this point for 2021. Mm. Jesus, you, you wonder what the fuck Brody Van Wagenen is seeing and who is in his ear or who he's, like, talking to that's like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm, go for it, bro. So. <sighs> It's tough to swallow. This was a tough season to swallow. I mean, you know, with more teams than ever being eligible to get into the play, the postseason, more playoff spots available and open, you know, with the Marlins being basically like just it looks like and appears like they're throwing the towel into the season before it even starts with the Phillies, you know, obviously Wheeler is a huge pickup. They have Real, Real Muto. You know, Harper, Arietta, Gregorius, Segura, Bohm came up and looked good. Um, stacked, but also making a ton of mistakes. You thought that there was the Nationals having a sophomore slump and, and a post championship hangover. There was an opportunity there for like the second place team gets a guaranteed spot in the playoffs and we couldn't pull it off. So we are not even a 500 team, which is. I just, what? I don't, does not compute. 404 error page. Cannot load. Like, what? <laughs> uh, you know, and if we just had Porcello and Waka pitch to their league, their career averages, I think we'd be in a better spot. If Matts didn't have a complete and total just... Meltdown, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. If Stroman had decided not to opt out, I mean, there's so many factors and variables that went into the season. Everything that probably could have gone wrong for the Mets did go wrong for them. So what does that say for 2021? I mean, you know, I think you have a, a decent core of young players that you can build around, but you definitely need, I mean, he's going to, He's going to have to address starting rotation. I think buyouts, we're going to be handing out buyouts left and right in the offseason. Ramos, take care. Chirinos, peace out. Uh, Batances, bye. Marisnik, gone. Like everyone that, everyone that Brody Van Wagenen has anointed and crowned as a Mets player and signed and acquired and traded for, you're gone. Like, um, I would love to see, I mean, this, I don't even know, this, this is probably not even possible, but like Cohen just handing a check to Robinson Cano for like $150 million. I mean, like it's been real. If you want to be our hitter, like a hitting bench coach, hitters coach, go for it.
but we need to make room for our younger guys and for people that can actually run out a ground ball. And I know that doesn't mean a lot in the, in the, at the pro level, but there have been a few instances where it's like, if we had a guy that could run full speed, <laughs> that would be, he would beat out the pitcher to the bag. And who knows where it goes from there. I mean, listen, listen, Cano is hitting out of his mind right now. I mean, he's, he's hot. He's in fuego, but like, it's just, why well, I, I don't know that you're going to get much more out of him like that next year, but I could be wrong. And uh, you know, the team likes him. So it's not, I guess it's unfair for me to say that, but you know, you know, even with all these players that have such nice looking stats, Conforto, Smith, Nimmo, even with all those players, we're still below 500. So what does that mean? I mean, people are shitting on Alonzo and saying like, oh, he's just taking a huge step back. And it's like, well, he hasn't taken that much of a step back. 13 homers, 30 some odd RBIs. 740 something OPS. I mean, over the course of 162 games, yeah, that's like close to 40 home runs, and that's close to, you know, 100 RBIs. It's kind of like, you know, it's not that far off from what he was his rookie year, and it's way better than a lot of other players in the league. It's just that his average stinks. You know, he's either striking out or he's hitting ding dongs. So. But I mean, this 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 core of like Conforto, Nimmo, Smith, Alonzo, Davis, McNeil, like, are we just two to three? Like, we need a an, uh, a lights out catcher. We need a consistently good offensive and defensive catcher. We need one more proven outfielder who, again, not a liability in the field and can also hit the ball. Is that available? Catcher, outfielder, and then we, I mean, you have to, uh, I mean, the pitching staff is just like, we know what we got with DeGrom. Lugo, I think you, they took a poll tonight. I think you probably put him in the starting rotation moving forward. He's proven that he can handle it. Fuck it. We need starting pitchers, starting pitchers at our premium. Bullpen arms are a dime a dozen. So let's move him to starting rotation. David Peterson has proved his worth there. So I think you have three dudes right there. You need two more. And then you gotta you gotta you gotta do something about this bullpen, man. Edwin Diaz appears to be back, question mark. But there are a lot of other just bigger question marks in that bullpen right now. You cannot count on Familia. Shreve is now not a sure thing. Wilson's not a sure thing. Hughes, Brock, like all these guys, they come in, you don't know what the fuck you're going to get. Not good. So Uncle Stevie's coming, and he's he's going to lay waste to, <laughs> to the organization. And really, and I really do hope he cleans house, even though there are people saying, well, is he really cleaning house when he's bringing back Alderson? He's keeping Mania. Now there's rumors that Terry Collins is, is going to stay. So it's like, well, are we really cleaning house or really just getting rid of Brody and all his fingerprints? I don't know. So that's the Mets. All right, let's talk Giants. Let's talk Giants, okay? Last week I previewed the Bears game week two, and I said that, this is a game that we definitely can win. I felt confident in our defense going against their offense. I, th I think Mitch Trubisky is a fraud and that we can expose him. We can get to him in the pass rush. I don't know that they had any real running game to speak of heading into the game. Their third down efficiency was such like garbage against the Lions in week one that I really thought it came down to what, is our offense going to be able to move the ball against that defense? Because it's still a pretty staunch, de staunch defense. And I felt like Barkley with Saquon Barkley was going to have a bounce back game. <laughs> and I thought the D was going to have a big day. 
And I was not right. <laughs> I was so incorrect about Barkley. Not so much about the defense. I think the defense still had itself a day, that's for sure, you know. Um, but the defense isn't the weakest unit that we have. I'll say that. So total yards was about even passing yards. We had more passing yards. And, you know, I think that's a testament to it's, it's twofold. One, you can't, or you can't say that we haven't improved in the secondary. The Logan Ryan signing was huge. He's been uh, tremendous. I think passers, quarterbacks have something like a 60 some odd QB rating when targeting him. James Bradbury, holy shit. We're going to get into some of his stats, but what a pickup. And, you know, there was there were criticisms about, you know, he allows this and he allows that, but when push comes to shove, he's not going to hurt your ball club. He's only going to help. Julian Love is still feeling his way through some things, and I think he still has the potential to be a breakout player. We haven't even really seen the best of Darnay Holmes yet. I mean, he had that 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 nice hit on Roethlisberger last week, but other than that, it's been kind of dicey with him. Jabril Peppers has been doing okay. So, you know, you give some more time to Isaac Yitam. Corey Ballantine is obviously not the answer at the second cornerback position, but at least he doesn't miss tackles. You know, <laughs> I'll say that. He, he gives up a lot of receptions that can be uh, pretty bad, but at least he's tackles. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, so, you know, the defense, and we'll get into some, some, some statistics in a little bit. The defense, I feel good about, you know. Now, do they still have at least one drive or two drives per game that you're like, fuck, man, that's not what we needed right there. Yeah, of course, they're not perfect. They're not at the level of the Steelers and the Bears just yet. But they are on the cusp. They are proving to be a much improved unit. And if Jason Carrick can get his act together and figure out how to utilize Evan Ingram and the squad that we have now, I'm the offensive line is starting to gel and get some chemistry. So we're, we were on the, I feel like we're right on the edge of something special. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have known that by looking at the first half. The first half was just God awful. And, uh, you know, I was late to the game. You know, we, like I said, we went to lunch with my father-in-law and his girlfriend. And so I didn't get back until probably two thirty ish. So I was playing a lot of catch up. But, uh, you know, I just remember being like, this is that first half. I was like, this is the complete opposite of what I was expecting. <laughs> I was not expecting this to come out this flat and this awful, you know, and people had talked and talked and talked about this is the first time that Daniel Jones will have Barkley, Ingram, Shepard, Tate, Slayton, all in the same field, all at the same time. And we didn't do anything with that, <laughs> with that setup, with that, with that lineup we didn't do anything which it, it, it's almost like as a quarterback when you have that many weapons it's actually too overwhelming for you where you're like I have to get every single one of them the ball and so there's this pressure on you to make sure you're distributing and facilitating to all the weapons you have versus okay I have this guy and I have this guy and I'm just going to try and figure out which one gives me the best opportunity in this play, as opposed to I now have five guys, all of which could be open on any play. I'm probably reading too much into that, and I'm probably you know overthinking it. But when has it ever come together and looked good? It's it's never happened. And then the the half that we the less than a half that we got it, nothing happened. <laughs> so you know, and maybe that's on Garrett, but. Fuck, like we get so excited to have all these dudes on the on the field at the same time and we were ultimately let down. So read into that how you will, if you will. Uh again, rush running the ball has been a major concern for us. We only rushed for 75 yards. Most of that came on Daniel Jones scrambles. Here's a fun fact. The Bears have allowed five individual hundred yard rushers since 2018. So 
Why I thought that Barkley was going to have a breakout game and bounce back, I don't know. I just know. I, I just thought, well, it couldn't get any worse than the Steelers game, and it turns out, yeah, it can get worse. <laughs> Chicago rushed for 135 yards. Um, I mean, that last drive, <sighs> Bears had the ball with like seven and a half minutes left in the game and just gashed us. I mean, they were average. I don't know how they didn't score on that friggin' drive because they were averaging like 10 yards run. And for them to abandon the run and throw the ball, what the fuck is going through your head? We have yet to stop the run and you guys are throwing the ball. Just keep running. Um, oh, and that fourth down play where they converted, you know, we had uh downs and Martinez double covering a tight end ball bounces off them and it goes into an offensive lineman's hand and he gets a first down. It's just like, Oh my God. So, um, Jones had another fumble, you know? So I think we're still in that, we're still in this weird spot where people, the, the headline is Daniel Jones turnover machine, you know? Tossed two, tossed interception and lost a fumble, and he's he's got X amount of turnovers in the first two games, and it's like some people are saying tank for Trevor Lawrence. What are you talking about, dude? What? No, negatory. No. Um, no. I mean Jones. If uh, you watch this dude play, his ability to evade the rush pick up first downs with his legs to make plays. I mean, the one shovel pass he had Deion Lewis, you know, people are calling it Favre-esque. You know, he makes plays. He's not just he's not just sitting back there and getting sacked and then just like, I, I've seen too many Giants quarterbacks over my lifetime to give up on this. How, how can you give up on this dude after less than 16? You haven't even given him 16 games yet. Played 12 last year. Played two this year. How about you give him two more games before you start making all these like ridiculous assumptions that he's donezo, that we don't need to stick with him. He's not a franchise quarterback. I mean, you're just not watching the games. Um, yeah, and sure, there is there was a play, and it was on I saw it on Twitter. It was someone's like still framing as a third and six, and he has two guys open right at the sticks, and he didn't pull the trigger. He 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 clutched. And then he ends up, you know, not getting the first down. It's like, that's one play out of how many pass attempts. He's going to, you know, he's not going to see everything just yet. He's not at that level. Like, is he Patrick Mahomes? No, but he still can be in the general area of Pat Mahomes and Lamar Jackson and a lot of these younger quarterbacks. He's definitely better than Sam Darnold. I mean, that's there's no comparison. And I guess Jets fans can make the argument that, well, look at what the fucking Jets are giving him in terms of like, you know, Le'Veon Bell is like always is not in the lineup half the time. And then his wide receivers are like a bunch of, uh, you know, no name stragglers, bums, if you will. Uh, you know, the offensive line, I mentioned it. They're struggling but they're getting a little bit better. They allowed four sacks. The Bears are 7-2 and two when their defense has more than two or more sacks since the start of 2019. They're 3-6 and six with one or fewer sacks. Chicago is now 13-4 and four in games when Khalil Mack has a, a, a sack more than a, a sack or more since acquiring him in 2018. He ended up getting a sack. So I think, yeah, Akeem Hicks may, may have gotten a sack. Um, PFF put out this stat, the most pressures allowed through week two chiefs, the chiefs at number five with 42, the Broncos at number four, 46, the Bengals at three with 52 Texans at one with 57 and the giants are one behind that with 56. So yeah, we're allowing a lot of the offensive line is allowing a lot of pressures, but this goes back to the whole rigmarole with the fact that Eli Manning was quick to get rid of the ball, some would say almost too quick to get rid of the ball and not letting a play develop, whereas Daniel Jones is on the other side, flip side of the coin, 
where he really lets the play develop. And some would say that he's not identifying the correct uh, choice quick enough. And then he ends up having to scramble or he takes a sack and the fumble and whatnot. So I don't know that you can entirely put that on the offensive line. I'd say there's a healthy chunk of that, not the majority of those pressures, but a healthy chunk of that that can probably be pinned on Daniel Jones. But again, youngin, he'll develop, have trust. So I bashed the, the Bears' third down efficiency last week, and I thought it was going to be a repeat of that. This week, in a, nope, complete opposite. They were 50, 56% on third down. And I, I mean, I, I mean, in the first half, it was just like every third down was converted. There was no, you know, we tend we clamped down in the second half, which was great. We we were had twenty three percent, which is just not it's not acceptable, and it's not going to get the job done. And uh, the Bears also won in terms of time of possession with nearly thirty five minutes, and uh, you know a large chunk of that went on that that final drive that they had where they just sat, they just sucked the life out of the clock, the game clock and left Daniel with only around two minutes to play with. So Jones was 25 of 40, 241 in an interception. He, this is the, uh, I think the first time he's never thrown a touchdown. So he's, uh, Jones is also one of three quarterbacks in the past 25 seasons with 25 or more passing touchdowns and 25 or more giveaways over their first 16 career games. Can you guess who the other two are? I'll, I'll take a minute. You take a moment. Collect yourself. Run through the old database. Brrr. All right, time's up. Peyton Manning and Matthew Stafford. Pretty elite company. Say what you will about Matthew Stafford, but he put some numbers. He might not be a winner, but is that completely on him? I don't know. Is Daniel Jones going to be the next Matthew Stafford? Oof. I kind of hope not. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, you know, Lions fans, I don't know many, and I haven't talked to many, but would you rather have Stafford or someone else? And I think they, they I believe they would still like to have Stafford man, uh, manning the wheel. So, it's pretty, I mean, I, uh, you know, Peyton Manning figured it out. He figured it out. 99, 2000. I mean, 98, he was just tossing interceptions left and right. 99, 2000, he was not. So I, you know, and here's, a, here's why I have faith in Daniel Jones and why everyone should have faith in Daniel Jones. Art Stapleton, Giants beat reporter, said the Giants quarterback coach, Jerry Skopinski, said this about Jones. I love coaching this guy. I love the way he competes. The guy is a tireless worker. I would say he works as hard, if not harder, than any young quarterback I've been around for sure and close to any quarterback I've been around. So this is not a guy who is going to make mistakes and then not learn from them. It's just it's just not in his DNA. It's not in his uh, the fiber of his being. This is a guy that's going to study what's going on, work on it and work on it and work on it. And we've seen little improvements here and there where there were a couple of plays where he drops back and he's not finding someone. And I'm saying to myself, throw the ball away, throw the ball away, throw the ball away. And there were a couple of times where he did. And there were a couple of times where he, he has guys swatting his arms and he protected the ball. So I think last year you would have seen maybe two fumbles, maybe two interceptions. Now you're seeing one interception, one fumble. And eventually it's going to be one to two touchdowns, zero interceptions or fumbles. I don't, you know, sure, there's a small, very small sliver, 1% of me, less than 1% of me that thinks that maybe he is a Jameis, Jameis Winston type. And that he's, I didn't watch enough Bucks games to know if that's accurate. I feel like that's not accurate. But that's what I'm seeing is like, holy shit, tons and tons of touchdowns, but also comes with tons and, you know, he's throwing four tutties, four picks. Which you can't have. You just don't win a lot of ball games that way. I don't think that's the case. Um, and I certainly hope he's not. I mean, Matthew Stafford, 
I really, I really want the best for him. I really do. And I, and I want the lions. I want the best for the lions because the, their fan base deserves it. So, um, you know, let's figure it out. Barkley had four carries for 28 yards, uh, before he tore his ACL. Uh, he's been placed in the IR. He's out for the rest of the season. That was deflating. I'm not going to lie. And I thought at that point, I was like, wow, is this about to turn into like a massive blowout? Like I had such high hopes. I was so certain of how we were going to play this game and how things were going to roll out. And it's now it's like, are we reliving 2017 again when we had all our receivers just perish on the field? And no, that was not the case. By the way, you look at that play. And it's, I still can't fathom how the fuck he tore his ACL on that, on that play. You watch it and it's like, first of all, they're on grass. They're not on artificial turf. So you can't use the turf as an excuse because that's when it usually happens. It's usually an artificial turf. And he didn't make, he didn't really make a sudden cut. He wasn't running, like, when I tore mine, and I know this, like, you're comparing a fat ass to an elite once-in-a-lifetime generational talent, but I was running full steam ahead for 100% as fast as that is, which is not, not that quick, but still enough force going forward, and tried to make a cut while still going, you know, as fast as I could forward. And I feel like you see that a lot where it's a guy trying to make a cut going fast forward or you know, making a cut, make a cut. He was not making a cut. He was running to his right and he like was trying to stop. So he would plant his foot. And if you watch him plant his foot, there wasn't any bend or wobble or like a, it, a, it didn't look like anything snapped or popped or it just, it just looked like he planted his foot and it wasn't like it buckled. It didn't look like the knee buckled at all. It's just, and and especially with someone like Saquon where it's like, I always had this thought in my head that when you tear your ACL, it's because you, the, the surrounding elements, you know, what, what is around the ACL was not strong enough to protect it. I mean, we're talking about fucking Saquads here. Like, you know, the amount of muscle that he has around that ACL, it's like, I don't understand how that ACL could even think about tearing. But it can get anyone, apparently. At any time, at any place, the ACL. Whew. Um, David Solo of Giants Alliance tweeted this out. According to the British Journal of Sports Medicine, 83% of elite athletes return to pre-injury form after ACL reconstruction. I cannot attest to that. (laughs) Uh, Adrian Peterson and Jamal Charles are two running backs that played at an all-pro level after their ACL tears. And uh, Barkley's only 23 and has plenty of football left. So I feel for the dude. I feel for him because he had kind of uh, off year. He had the high ankle sprain or whatever that sidelined him for a few games last year and to now miss all of 2020 after only a game and a, and, and some change. It sucks. And, you know, people were noting how he deleted all of his Instagram posts except for one, which is symbolic. It's just the, the Mamba, Kobe Bryant, his idol, one of his idols. And he, he, that's to him, that's a signal to everyone else. Hey, I've got that Mambo mentality and it's not a knock against the giants. It's not him saying like he wants out of the organization or anything like that. I don't know how anyone can infer that or interpret that move as anything but that. And it's, I'm, I'm, it, you know, and he just wrote in an Instagram post going to be, going to be a hell of a story. And I think Joe judge echoed that sentiment, just saying it's going to be a hell of a story. I think everyone's saying that it's going to be a hell of a story. You can pretty much put, put, put your fucking savings account on the futures bet prop bet of Saquon being the comeback of player of the year next year. Absolutely. 
put the goddamn farm on that bet because he's going to work his dick off and it's going to be a uh, night night for the rest of the league next year. And that was the year that I really pointed to to say that, like, that's the year where we make uh, a real push and where we're, people take us seriously. People are, people are starting to take us a little more seriously now uh, because of the performance of our defense and special teams. And if our offense can just get on the same goddamn page, I think that uh, we can make a, can at least threaten for the second wild card spot or that seventh playoff spot this year. Uh, so replacing Saquon, what do we do? Oh my goodness. Deion Lewis was the featured back because Wayne Gallman was inactive. He had 10 carries with 20 yards and a touch. Um, you know, a lot of people were saying that he just can't identify the hole or he's not quick to the hole and he just kind of gets lost in the, in the mix of things. I think on that touchdown run, which, uh, if you watch, you, you gotta, if you're a Giants fan, you have to tune into the Joe judge report. It's such a great, video series that they have where he dissects one offensive play, one key offensive play, one key special teams play, and one key def- defensive play. He broke down Deion Lewis's touchdown on fourth and goal, um, which, you know, that's what I kind of have been expecting from Joe Judge, and that's why I was wondering why he didn't go for fourth for the touchdown fourth and goal after the muff punt in week one because I thought, oh, this is like his opportunity. This is like his welcome party this is his arrival his calling card this is what is going to put him on the map is going for it you know quasi first drive of the game fourth and goal and we get it and he didn't do it he kicked the field goal here he goes for it and we get it and it pumped everyone up because he you know and maybe it's a temperature check for him he's taking a look at his team and he's saying okay we got this muff punt but is the offense like do i feel like they're in the right headspace to go for it last week no this week yes um, but he has high praise for Deion Lewis and I, uh, y- you can tell, <laughs> and we'll get to the, uh, the huge important signing. We wouldn't have signed that, uh, quote unquote, top free agent who was still on the market after all this time. If he, f- if he truly thought that Deion Lewis was like <laughs> the feature back. So, um, I'm, I'm very curious to see how. Garrett approaches the game plan against the Niners. I'll say that Sterling Shepard also had a catch for six, uh, six uh, a catch, a carry for six yards on a jet sweep. I'd love to see more of that. I think you probably should get Slayton in the mix. I probably get Evan Ingram in the mix. I think, you know, each of those guys should have at least one carry per game. You know, I think you really have to throw as much as you can at, at today's defenses to, to confuse them and get them, get them, uh, on their toes or on their heels. So you're looking at receivers. Um, I said that Ingram was going to bounce back and he did. He had eight targets. uh, Most of which were in the second half, six catches for 65 yards. Of course, most people remember that he slipped on that one pat on Jones interception. You look at the interception and again, people were correct to point out that Sterling Shepard was wide open on the other side of the seam, other side of the hash mark. And it would have been a first down. Instead, he goes to Engram, who slips, and of course, it goes it goes for an interception. Um, I also think that they are starting to now use him correctly. I watched a bunch of run plays where they had him with his hand down. He was not next to the tackle. He was, uh, you know, kind of back off the line in like a wing back type of um, position. And any run that they had, they basically just had Ingram run like a wheel route or like just try and make it look like he's running it, releasing into a pattern to get his guy to follow him. And that was like the game plan. Like we're not going to have Evan Ingram block on a lot of runs. We're going to have him try and run off his defender to make it look like it's a pass. And with Sterling Shepard's injury, which, you know, why why did anyone ever think that Sterling Shepard was going to stay healthy 
he's been placed on the IR. He'll be uh, out at least three weeks with a toe injury, which, I mean, you know, it's a freak thing. I don't know that you can prepare for that kind of tackle. I don't know how you, like, train and practice for that kind of tackle where the guy's going to land on your friggin' foot and drive your toe into the turf. Like, how do you prepare for that? How do you, like, I don't know. He had two catches for 29 yards and uh, on four targets. And, you know, I think whew, it's tough. Concussions, injury prone. When he's healthy and on the field, he's great. But when can he stay on the field? And he has, and we gave him that massive extension, you know? And at this point, I can't even, you know, is he even really the, even the number two receiver? Golden Tate had five catches on five targets for 47 yards, was basically MIA for most of the first half. And then, of course, he has that offensive pass interference to end the game, which, you know, you look at that final play, and I'm sorry, I, like everyone was, <laughs> you could have penalized everyone for pass interference, both offense and defense on that play. Uh, you know, Angram got double teamed and was getting like straight up like groped and and harassed and molested in the end on the goal line by two different bears. It's it's like, yeah, Tate pushed off, but then a, a, another defender came up and clocked him before he, the ball got to him. So honestly, I, I, if you're a ref, I think you just got to go offsetting penalties, replay the down and then uh, go from there. Good to see that we got Deion Lewis a little more involved in the passing game, of course, I talked about that shovel pass from Jones on the crucial third down when he was uh, getting dragged down. He he, he uh, shoveled it to Deion Lewis. So I think it'll be nice to – they got to figure out a way. You know, they were splitting Barkley out more, which is good to see before he got hurt, and I think they, they could probably do that with Lewis as well. And I believe Lewis is not that bad of a blocker either. Uh, Slayton – Six targets, three catches, 33 yards. Not his best effort. So he has games like this once in a while. You know, and I think it's very possible that the Bears decided to shift their coverage and focus their attention on Slayton, knowing that they can't let him get behind them and they can't let him, you know, get in those mid-level range, deep crossing routes, outs, whatever, what have you. So... Um, and he also had that huge drop on the third down that ended a drive that could have resulted in, in more points. That was a bad one. That was, uh, you know, there was, there was, I mean, it's a catchable ball. It's right in the hands, right in the chest, right in the numbers. Got to catch it. And if he catches it, he probably gets some, he not only gets the first down, but he can probably get a whole lot more yards after that. So, you know, CJ board had three catches for 32 yards on three targets. Damian Ratley, two targets, no catches. Caden Smith, three targets, two catches, negative one yards. Ugh. Still have not figured out how to you how to get back to the Caden Smith of 2019, which is frustrating. I mean, you know, the the alignment, the scheme and the alignment that's going to work for us on most downs. Caden Smith lines up as the uh, hand down tight end. Evan Ingram is your slot receiver. Golden Tate is on the other side. Darius Slayton is outside. And I think that's what's going to end up being the one that gives you the best productivity. Got to see more out of Golden Tate. And maybe his hamstring was still kind of bothering him, but, um, you know, we need we need him to come up with a big play. And we need Slayton to come up with a big play. And that's how we stay in ballgames. Kind of crazy that we brought in Damian Ratley in place of Corey Coleman, a guy, Corey Coleman, a guy who's been around the offense for, you know, been around the team, familiar, and they just let him go to bring in this Damian Ratley dude who hasn't done shit. I don't know. Prove me wrong, man. Uh, but the biggest takeaway is our 29 points in two weeks is, is dead last in the NFL. We just got to score more points. We have to. And I know the turnovers are, in, are, are drive killers, and we don't end up with points on those drives. But we need points. Got to get points. Um, what stinks is like our, our defense is forcing 
we're getting turnovers, but we're also forcing fumbles, but we're not getting on the ball. We're not we're not recovering the ball. Like Logan Ryan had a forced fumble on Mooney, I think it was, who had himself a day and just couldn't get on it. You know? I, I think that's what the veteran leadership that Logan Ryan brings, that James Bradbury brings. They they know that, okay, if you catch the ball on me, I'm poking that ball. I'm getting that ball out. So maybe you might have won the battle, but we're gonna win the war. Um, yeah, and I mentioned it earlier, but James Bradbury, one intercept, that interception he had. Gotta be top five interception in Giants history. I I mean, is it is that hyperbole? Is that an exaggeration? Dude was not looking at the ball. He was basically face guarding, which, you know, could have been a penalty. But he avoids the penalty. His man goes up, has the clear cut advantage, has the leverage on that. It's not as the, you know, what's his face? Charles Davis said, or whatever the fuck his name is, said in the broadcast, like, this is not even, this is not a 50 50 ball. This is like an 80 20 ball in favor of the receiver. And Bradbury somehow, it's almost like a Willie Mays esque catch in the outfield where it's like over the head, he's able to raise his head, see the receiver, catch the ball. And strip and bring it right back into his body. An all-time interception. Unbelievable. And the fact that he was on the sideline, he could have very easily been out of bounds and somehow got landed inbounds. Just unreal. He also had four uh, passes defended. One of the passes he able it was able to knock and tip up to Julian Love, who got his first pick. Um, and I love to see this Dalvin Tomlinson has a pass defended because he's got his arm up. He's rushing the quarterback. He saw they didn't have a chance. He saw Mitch locked in and loaded and ready to throw. And he got his big paw up and knocked it down. And that's what you have to do, especially against quarterbacks that have a low release point. So I think it'd be nice to have more of our defenders, uh, you know, free themselves, free the minds and the rest will follow. Uh, Blake Martinez, I believe he led the team in tackles again. Six solos, two assists, one sack, one uh, tackle for loss. But for whatever reason, I feel like he took a step back. And maybe that's because he had that one, you know, on the first, the Bears' first touchdown on that first drive where, you know, uh, Trubisky scrambling to his right and he ends up tossing to Montgomery on the backfield. By the way, our defense looked like just refuse on that play. Just absolute like a, a dumpster barge on fire. And it reminded me of that, I guess, the Cowboys-Rams game where Elliott made that cutback along the sideline and like 15 Rams went flying by him. Um, But... On that play, Martinez had a choice. It's either you go after Trubisky and you abandon Montgomery or you stick with Montgomery and then Trubisky runs for a first down. I'd like to, I would have liked, and I know he wants to force Trubisky to make the decision, and we know Trubisky probably is not the best with decisions. Although, you know, we give Trubisky a lot of shit, but, I mean, he was fairly accurate, and that's why the, the their third down efficiency was so good was, you know, he was accurate, plain and simple. But uh, I feel like Blake took a little bit of a step back this past week. I think uh, he got caught up in the wash on a couple of runs, was not too terribly terrific on in coverage, but still he's given us better, you know, a better outing than uh, Ogletree or anyone else that we could throw out there. So I, I, I'm, I don't want to dwell on, on the negative. I want to accentuate the positive. He's still bringing a level of intensity and know-how and ability to, to this defensive unit. We are better off having him uh, as part of the team, no doubt. But I don't think he had as good a game as he did last week. Logan Ryan... Um, had himself a ball game. He had the forced fumble, and uh, he he, I mean, pretty much mistake free ball. And uh, I like having him with 
Peppers and Love on the field. I think that's a good alignment. It's a good look for us. Dexter Lawrence had a, a, a nice game, five tackles. Bradbury, obviously, the four tackles. Bradbury was named the Week 2 Defensive MVP by Pro Football Focus. Uh, he allowed one catch on six targets, which is, whew, can't get much better than that. His 93.1 coverage grade is a career best since he entered the NFL in the 2016. So I feel like he's only going to, you know, that's, I wouldn't say that's going to be like the norm with him, but I don't think this is all, I don't think this is an exception or an anomaly either. I feel like this, you're going to see, you're going to see him grade out in the 70s and 80s on a week to week basis. You know, none of this like 60 and below, you know, shtick or, or, garbage that we've been fed by a lot of the haters. Fackrell had a decent game. Uh, sack and two tackles for loss. Ooh, Lorenzo Carter had another sack and a tackle for loss. BJ Hill got himself a sack and a tackle for loss. Uh, I guess the most disappointing, like Leonard Williams had, an, had a decent game. Yeah, he There were more than a few times where he got doubled hard. <laughs> it was like, whoa. I don't even know how you deal with that. Um, I would say there were a few guys that probably underperformed. I'd like to see more out of O'Shane Zimenez. It seems like he's probably losing his 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 spot in the starting lineup to Fackrell. Um, we talk so much about Darney Holmes and how we had such high expectations since he had such a great camp, and we saw all this shit on social media about him, while, you know, balling out with Peppers and. He's kind of not really made his mark yet. Ballantyne, in my mind, is a stopgap. You know, I mean, on that touchdown to Mooney, it's like you you just you gotta you gotta give yourself a better opportunity to break up the pass and not just like eat Mooney's ass. You know, on on that on that play. So Ballantyne's a stopgap. The item hasn't really shown much so far, but. Maybe it's just him getting acclimated, you know, so I haven't written him off yet. Um, I know that Austin Johnson did receive a lot of negative criticism, especially on that last drive because he was getting pushed around like crazy. So, you know, we're susceptible to the run, apparently, which is weird because it used to be we're great against the run and we stink in the pass rush. And now we're like got a little bit of pass rush going, but we just can't stop the freaking run. Giants are fourth in fourth in the league in defense, allowing 326.5 yards a game. So, you know, I think we're doing all right <laughs> defensively. I think we're doing all right. You know, there are just one or two drives where it's like, we really needed to stop there. <laughs> we really needed to get off the field because there's a momentum shift going on, and instead you you are like letting the other team kill the clock or letting this – like crazy 17 play drive go for a score. Gano is two for three on field goals. Uh, you know, the missed field goal was like what, a 56, 57 yarder. I'm not gonna knock him for that. I mean, it was it would be great if he nailed it and he hit it because, you know, towards the end of the game, we could have had enough he could have hit it the game winner. So that would have been nice. But I mean, you know, it's 57 yards. It's not a gimme. Riley Dixon had another great game. Uh, yeah, I mean, Trubisky didn't put up entirely great numbers, 18 and 28, 190, two touches and two picks. You know, David Montgomery was averaging like 5.1 yards per carry. Cordero, 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 oh boy, Patterson. Whew. Seven carries, 25 yards. It's still weird seeing him like getting a bunch of carries wearing 84. But I guess you eat, I don't know. That's an interesting situation. Remember Tariq Cohen? Remember when he was like a thing? He's like, he's just like a non factor now. Uh, but yeah, David Montgomery just burned us. Alan Robinson. Nine targets. Nine. Nine targets. Shout out Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Three catches, 33 yards. So that is, to me, 
a, a, a clear sign and indicator that we that we are able we're doing we're doing the right things on defense. Maybe we're not all the way there yet, but we like the fact that we're we're taking the number one receiver out of the game on that level is is a good sign. It's just Darnell Mooney, who is like their number, I don't even know what wide receiver he is. Usually I think Anthony Miller is like their number two, right? But, or Patterson, I don't know. But Montgomery, um, you know, Montgomery had the touchdown. Mooney had the touchdown. But you look at these numbers from the giant, from the Bears receivers and nothing really pops out as you. It's like, wow, we got torched, which is, which is something we couldn't say last year. Um, so yeah. And, and Bobby Skinner from talking giants basically summed it up the best. The Daniel Jones fumble, Darius Slayton, third down drop, Graham Gano missed field goal, which, you know, and the Everton Engram slipping on the interception. Those four plays really what are, what came back to haunt us and really made the difference in the game. Um, you know, if you want to get really Debbie Downer about it, yeah. Team has now started 0-2 for four consecutive seasons and seven of the past eight. It's kind of just like what people expect from us now. We go 0-2. That's just how we do. Um, but this is a, a I know the results are the same. And I know the numbers, you know, it's all wins and losses when it comes down to it. You can have the best defense, but if you're not making the postseason, if you have a losing record, you are you that much better? Like, uh, you know, but it does feel different. It really does. Um, and, you know, it's a test. It, a lot of this is what we're experiencing now is a result of the fact that we have zero players on this team today that were on the 2015 Giants. Does that blow your fucking mind? That was five years ago. We don't have any players from that team on this team. So. You know, rebuilds suck. Sometimes the rebuilds are done in a season, and some of them take five or more, like the Giants. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I hinted at this earlier, and every Giants fan knows what I was talking about. But the big signing with Saquon going down is Devontae Freeman. I like the signing. I really do. I think he gives you something that is different from Wayne Gallman, and it's different from Deion Lewis. And I'm not going to say it's like an earth, wind, and fire type vibe to it. But if Garrett is smart, he can utilize each of those players to their strengths and show a variety of looks. And even though Freeman is a workhorse, so we said before, Deion Lewis, not a workhorse. That doesn't mean he can't help us in other ways. Davante Freeman is a workhorse. But should we be leaning on him as much as the Falcons did? No, I believe that you you don't healthy scratch Gallman anymore. Let's not do that. Let's keep Gallman, Freeman, and Lewis, and let's find out a way to get those three operating at 100% efficiency. And I think if you're able to do that, you're going to see it's going to pay dividends. So if you're not familiar with what happened with Devontae, Devontae Atlanta released him um, uh, two years through his five-year extension in March, which is yeah a little bit of a red flag but next and uh if it doesn't get much prettier from what i've written here but next gen stats released uh had, came up with a new category new stat expected yards expected rushing yards or expected yards per attempt or something like that freeman's rushing yards over expectation per attempt were were more than a full yard below what was expected of him. Among qualifying rushers, Freeman posted the worst RYOE per attempt in the entire NFL. You know, that basically, this stat was devised to remove the quality of your offensive line and to focus on, okay, so if you have a shitty offensive line, you're expected to get this per attempt. And he was doing worse than that. So 
But then you have some people saying the Atlanta Falcons offensive line was that bad. <laughs> and so, you know, um, I don't think, ironically, I don't think Gurley did much better. Todd Gurley did much better with the Rams, and yet the Falcons signed him as a free agent. So does anyone know what they're really doing? <laughs> Uh, there was a, a list, the top 10 running backs exceeding expected rushing yards. Saquon was ranked fifth in 2019. Um, even when a runner barely breaks a thousand yards, his R Y O E can show us how he's still excelling amid his circ- amid his circumstances. Barkley's yards per game fell slightly from his rookie mark of 81.7 but his triple digit RYOE pr- proves he's still playing better than expected based on how his line of blocking for him. That was obviously before this year. And that's not a surprise to anyone who's followed the giants. I mean, there have been plenty of plays where he looks like he should be stopped for negative one, negative two yards, maybe a yard, maybe two yards. And he breaks it for five, six, seven or a touchdown. <laughs> so, um, you know, is he this generation's Barry Sanders? I say yes, but with more playoff victories, hopefully. Also on that list, Leonard Fournette, who was ninth, but still got released by the Jaguars. So something's not exactly jiving. I don't know that that next-gen stats should be the be-all, end-all. And I know that I have a tendency to say numbers never lie, but there's some reasons with the numbers kind of fib a little bit. Giant Insider posted this on Twitter. You think rushing the ball isn't important? In the last five seasons, 34 of the 50 teams, that's 68% of teams that finished in the top 10 in rushing made the playoffs. Yeah, and that was a major priority and objective of Dave Gettleman. Hog mollies, my man, hog mollies. We're going to ground and pound, we're going to run the ball, and that's where we're going to get back to the playoffs. And so I thought, and I think a lot of fans thought, we're going to come out and we're going to, Saquon's going to get 25 carries per game. And I think they kind of tried that in week one and saw that it was getting nowhere and were forced to throw the ball. And so, you know, my philosophy heading into week two was like, Hey, let's maybe pass the ball on first down to open up the run on second down and it'll be more successful. But that I don't even know if that's going to be the case moving forward. I think it's going to really just, it's, it's all going to come down on, on Daniel's, uh, on Daniel's shoulders. And I think he's up to the challenge. I really do. Um, speaking of the Falcons, Freeman's former team, come on, Atlanta. Like, come on, Atlanta. You're better than that. What, what is it about you and blowing leads? Falcons had 39 points with zero turnovers and a loss against the Cowboys. Entering today, teams were 440 and zero. So 440 wins, zero losses when scoring 39 points with zero turnovers since 1933 when turnovers were first tracked, according to Elias Sports Park. God damn it. You know, I was happy that the Eagles lost, and I thought that we might get away with the Cowboys' loss, and so us being at 0-2, not as bad as we thought because – uh, you know, the, the Washington football team is kind of a mixed bag. It's hard to, it's, it, it's hard to have any really key takeaways at this point because it's like, okay, Washington came back and beat Philly in week one. Philly then gets tra- – like ha- was within striking distance of the Rams at one point in like the third quarter maybe. They came back in the first half and then in the third quarter they were in striking distance and then they just the floodgates opened. Multiple injuries against uh, along the offensive line. So you have to think that the Cowboys m- m- are like the favorite to win the division, but I thought they were going to be clear Super Bowl contender favorites. And through two weeks, they uh, they could very easily be 0-2 right now. And their defense is not what it's all cracked up to be, which we, you know, we knew that their secondary was going to be a problem, but we didn't know that. I guess Vanna Ash would go down, that Sean Lee would be out, and that, you know, that front that front line is not uh, as as sturdy and as intimidating as they uh, have been made out to be. All right, so that's 
that's where we're at right now, you know? Let's preview the week three game against the 49ers. And I got to tell you, and I know people are probably at this point like, Neil, you're a joke. And I get that. <laughs> but I really do think we have a shot, a, a, an even better shot at beating the Niners than we did at beating the Bears. I'm more confident that we will beat the 49ers than I was about beating the Bears. And I was pretty damn confident about beating the goddamn Bears. Okay. And here's why. Injuries, my man. The 49ers are beat up. And it's like, yeah, we lost Barkley for the season. Yeah, Shep is out for three weeks. Got it. But you look at what we did offensively in the second half. We moved the goddamn ball in the second half with Ingram, with Tate, you know, with Slayton, with Lewis. And now that we have, I mean, Freeman's not going to get a whole lot of snaps this week, but hopefully Gallman is active and can make a difference. So I, I really do think that with all the injuries that the Niners have, that we have probably our best shot of the year thus far to get our first W. D Ford, doubtful. He's expected to miss the game. Raheem Mostert, starting running back, doubtful. Isn't expected to play. Jason Verrett, questionable. Cornerback, George Kittle, tight end, questionable. I mean, I watched that George Kittle injury in week one, and it, just, it was like, Ew. I've had that happen to me and I was out for probably a few weeks. So if, even if he does come back, is he going to be a hundred percent? Probably not. Nick Bosa, torn ACL out for the year. Tevin Coleman, doubtful. Kyle Shanahan, the coach said uh, he's expected to miss multiple weeks. Jimmy G, Garoppolo, questionable Shanahan said that he still has a chance to, to suit up against the Giants on Sunday even if he does is he gonna be as good as he was pre-injury probably not not that they really leaned on him that much or rely on than him that much because they're a run first kind of team and that's how they find their success is on the ground but the, the just the fact that he's not going to be as mobile that's in our favor Defensive end Solomon Thomas is doubtful. May have sustained an ACL injury in the win against the Jets. Richard Sherman is obviously out. I mean, that's a lot of key starters. Almost 10 key starters for the Niners. If we can't take advantage of that and beat them when they're at their weakest, I don't know how, you know, I think at that point, it's kind of like, yeah, let's just, yeah, my, all my confidence goes down to zero. <laughs> it goes into the negative. It goes into the red. Um, you know, this is not the Niners team. San Francisco is not an offensive juggernaut by any means. They're not, they're not like the greatest show on turf. They rely on the run on the run. Their, their uh, rushing attack is third in the league in yards per attempt. Uh, they don't turn the ball over, which is crucial, which is, you know, Daniel Jones needs to take out his pen, open up his notebook, write it down, turnovers, turnovers, turnovers. They do not fumble the ball. They lead the league in fumbles not lost, and they're fourth in total turnovers not lost, so they don't throw interceptions, they don't fumble the ball, they don't turn it over. Now, that's with, you know, most dirt. And Coleman and Jimmy G is that the same with Nick Mullins and Jarek McKinnon? You're gonna rely on Jarek McKinnon, um, but it's really their defense that that drives the engine, that drives the ship. Sixth in the league in points against, allowing 18.5 per game. Um, they do not give up a lot of passing yards or passing touchdowns, but they do give up a lot of rushing yards. So maybe this is our opportunity to. Have Gallman and Lewis, and I, I don't. I like I said, I don't know that Freeman is really going to get a whole lot of action. But let's pound the rock. This is our opportunity to get our running game back to uh, a spot where we feel content and satisfied with what we got going on in the ground attack. Let's pound the rock. We have an opportunity now. To not have to lean on Daniel so hard. To not feel like it's all on him. To not feel like he has to make a play. Hand the ball off. 
let's do all these scissor action that Sean O'Hara was talking about with Jason Garrett's new offense. Let's scissor the hell out of the 49ers. You know, let's pound. Let's get aggressive. And uh, let's, let's get back to that mentality and that philosophy that Dave Gettleman wanted to instill and that is so imperative and important for us to make the, the playoff push, if that's even in the cards. Run the ball. But also get creative with it. Don't just be so like, we're going to go heavy formation and go dive right, dive left. No, you got to like spread it out and, and um, you know, alter the looks a little bit there. Yeah, so um, I mentioned that our defense has made tremendous strides, and, and here's an example of why. We're fourth in yards allowed. We're fifth in interceptions. Um, we've allowed the least amount of rushing t- touchdowns among all NFL teams, but we do, we have a little problem and issue with giving up yards, 141 yards in the first game, 135 yards in this and last week. Without Coleman, without Mostert, with just Jarek McKinnon, I feel like we can hold this team to under a hundred yards especially if Jimmy Garoppolo is not 100%. I feel like we can stack the box and we can force Garoppolo or Nick Mullins to throw the ball. And I feel like with our improved secondary, with another week with Ryan more familiar, Yida more familiar, and that whole team just having another week under their belt, I really do think that we're going we're gonna to pull out a victory. I mean, our offense is due for a, a, a nice game. We're third in turnover percentage, which is largely on, largely on Daniel Jones. We're 28th in scoring percentage, and we're 31st in red zone percentage. So that's got to change. If, you, if we really want to be, you know, we've taken steps. We've shown a lot of fight. No one's disagreeing with that. We don't quit. We show a lot of fight. Great. But that needs to start to translate to wins. In order for that to happen, no more turnovers. And when we get in the red zone, we have to put it in the end zone. We're dead last in points scored. We're dead last in rushing. And uh, I feel like that's, we're going to flip the script on the all in San Francisco this weekend. Just going back to DJ real quick. Only 12% of his throws have been bad, according to Pro Football Reference. 77 have been on target. So I... I don't know that you can really – I don't know how you look at Daniel Jones. You watch him play every game, and you look at him, and you see some of the stats he's putting up, and you say to yourself, yeah, tank for Trevor Lawrence. I don't know how you do that. I really don't. It makes me think that – you know how they, there are these, like, bots on Twitter that are trying to, like, uh, misinform and try – like, especially with the NBA, they have, like, these bots that – <laughs> are you know are set up and tweet out these like automated messages about uh in response to Black Lives Matter and what NBA is doing with Black Lives Matter and saying like I've been a season ticket holder since 1979 and yet like it's a it's for a team that's only been in existence for the past 10 years <laughs> you know like the Grizzlies or something so you know it's fake but like it you know you you read it and it's so uh, assertive and aggressive that you're like, whoa. And so that's meant to like scare people, but people are keen to it and are on to it. And it's not 2016 anymore. It's 2020. I feel like that's happening with Daniel Jones. These people, th- these are just bots on Twitter that are set up by Cowboys fans or Jets fans or someone, Eagles fans, like someone who's got a, a grudge against the New York football giants and is spouting all this misinformation and it, you know, uh, disrupting what what are the positive good vibes we have about DJ. Tank for Trevor Lawrence. What the f- actual f? Um, I will say this though, Jones has a thirty nine point six QB rating when throwing to Damian Ratley. Again, hard to kind of see what the coaching staff have seen has, has seen in Ratley to make them think that he was an upgrade or better choice than Corey Coleman so far. 
And uh, Jones has a 27.5 rating when throwing to Evan Ingram. That has got to change. I mean, Ratley's Ratley. I don't even know if he's going to end up, like, finishing the year with us. But I think it's it's a crime. It's a felony. It's a misdemeanor to have that lower rating when throwing to Evan Ingram. And that, to me, Jason Garrett needs to get and. Freddie Kitchens need to get in a room with Evan Ingram and say, hey, man, what do you like? What what don't you like? What do you feel comfortable with? What do you feel like uh, you like? What, what can we do for you <laughs> to make this game easier so that we can get the best out of you? Jones also has an 8% drop percentage, which is it's not low. I know 8% sounds low, but it's not. It's not low. And uh, I'll finish by saying that the 49ers are favored by four. Hmm? All those injuries, they're favored by four? Hammer the Giants. At least hammer the Giants against the spread. But I'm confident you can take the money land and win some da 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 bills, y'all. So that's the, that's the show. That's the, this week's show. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, let's go Giants. And even though the the Mets are technically, I mean, that people are already saying they're eliminated. I don't think they're mathematically eliminated just yet. I don't think. So let's go Mets. This has been giant mess. And what I learned today through a <laughs> something my wife read about on a parenting blog is that we need to look at messes as happy mistakes, kind of like a. It's almost like a Bob Ross type feel to it. Sure, the Giants are a mess and the Mets are a mess. But these are all little happy mistakes. And eventually, all these little happy mistakes, we're going to turn into a beautiful painting of a championship trophy. <laughs> all right, that's the show. Thanks for listening to my bullshit. Adios, muchachos.